Hi, this is David Desert of Pancanology.com. I'm an engineer and pancreatic cancer survivor. Understanding cancer research has given me insights into finding some of my most effective treatment options. Today I'm going to discuss kaplan meier graphs, which are an important part of many research papers. They're used to estimate the success of treatment in trials where patients might withdraw early. Real patient data is hard to acquire, and the kaplan meier estimator takes advantage of most of it. I'm going to show you each patient's contribution to the graphs, and I'll also discuss how confident researchers are in their results. In this video, we're going to recreate the kaplan meier graph from this paper here, a study on fulfirinox for metastatic pancreatic cancer patients. Inside the paper, there are two curves for progression-free survival, and we're going to recreate this bottom one here. Here's what the final kaplan meier graph will look like. This graph shows progression-free survival, the ratio of patients whose tumors did not grow by more than 20%. It starts out at the top left at time zero with 1.0. No one has had tumor growth. Each drop here represents one or more patients who have had tumor growth, the event that we're interested in. You can see that as time goes on, the drops get larger. We get larger drops after patients have been censored or if more than one patient progresses simultaneously. These hash marks represent patients that have left the trial without triggering the event. The researchers may have lost contact with them or the trial may have ended before they progressed. Their data no longer contributes to the curve after these marks. The trial we're looking at has 17 patients enrolled. We'll use this table over here to collect the patient data. Here are the 17 patients in order of their accrual. If the tumor grew, the time is recorded and they're given a status of PR. If the researchers lose contact with them, the time of last contact is recorded and they're given a status of LC. If the trial ends with their tumor growing, the time is recorded and they're given a status of ST. Right now, this table lists the patients in the order that they were enrolled. However, it's going to be much easier for us if we sort the patients by the time of their event. So let's do that. The patient status we wrote earlier is really more information than we need to draw the kaplan meier graph. What we're really interested in is whether an event happened or not. In a progression-free survival curve, the event is disease progression, which we identify by measured tumor growth. In an overall survival graph, the event would be patient death. Since we only care about whether the event happened or not, we'll replace all the PR status, or tumor progressed, with a 1, meaning the event happened. With all other patients, tumor growth event did not happen, and we replace them all with 0. In kaplan meier terminology, these patients are called censored. Now we have all the data that we need to draw the kaplan meier curve. The kaplan meier curve has time on the x-axis and the fraction of patients without the event on the y-axis. In our example, this means the fraction of patients in any given time that did not have tumor growth. You might also see the y-axis presented as a percentage of patients from 0 to 100%. Let's get started with the first patient. At time zero, all patients are still in the trial, so our curve starts out at the top left. The kaplan meier terminology is that all 17 patients are still at risk for tumor progression. The time recorded is at 0.49 months, and we draw our line right to that time. 100% survival for the first 0.49 months. At 0.49 months, we've had this event, and we're going to drop our line by some amount. At the time of this event, there were 17 patients in the trial, and now we've had one event. We'll drop the line by 1 17th. One event out of 17 patients at risk for the event. So let's move on to the second patient. We'll draw our line out to the right to this patient's time of 1.84 months. At this time, there was another event, and we'll again drop our line by another amount. At the time of this event, there were 16 patients at risk, and now we've had one more event. We'll drop the line from the current height by 1 16th of the remaining height. 
Some of you are getting ready to tell me that this is the same as dropping one seventeenth of the total height from 1 to 0. Well, you're right, but I'm purposely basing this new drop from the current height for reasons that should become clearer after we look at our first censored patient. Now let's do the third patient. Again, we're going to draw the line right over to 2.25 months. So we've had another event, and we're going to drop the line. But we now have 15 patients at risk, and we're going to drop the line from the current height by 1 15th of the remaining height. And these next three events stair-step down the exact same way. 1 14th, 1 13th, and 1 12th. And now we come to our first censored patient. Censored patients should be marked with a plus or a hash mark, but not all the graphs do this. Because a censored patient is not an event, the height of the line does not drop. We're just putting a mark on the line at the time of the censored patient. Another way to kind of think of this is uh, we've had zero events out of 11 patients at risk, and we're going to drop the line by zero out of 11th, which is no drop at all. Next up is another censored patient. Again, we're marking it with a plus, and the height of the line is not going to drop. But you should notice that the number of patients at risk is still going down. And here we have a third censored patient marked with another plus. We've come to the next event. There are only eight patients left at risk. For this single event, we're dropping the line by one-eighth. This is a larger drop than any of the previous ones, and that's because of the prior censored patients. We don't know whether those censored patients had tumor growth or not, so from this time on, they won't affect the curve. But you could think of it this way. Each event takes place in an imaginary new trial, holding only the at-risk patients, like I'm showing in this new box. In here, we drop the line from the top by one-eighth. The next censored patient is indicated by a mark. A single event from six patients at risk means we drop by one-sixth. Because these prior censored patients have been removed, the steps are starting to get larger. Another censored patient. One event from four at risk. Two more censored patients. And the final patient has an event, dropping our PFS curve all the way down to zero. Everyone has either progressed or was censored from the trial. Here we have the final progression-free survival curve. It's our best estimate of the trial results. And here we can see the effects of all 17 patients on the graph. There are vertical drops for each patient event and plus marks for each censored patient. Everyone is shown here. Now I'd like to show you what a small change in the data does to the graph. Let's consider this last censored patient at 15.18 months. In our original data collection, this patient had stable tumor growth when the trial ended. But what would happen to the graph if the trial held open for another month and this patient still had not progressed? Here's that change in blue. This ending looks a lot better. The point to understand here is that these estimates at the right end of the curve, they're based on very few data points. A small difference in the data, and this is only one patient, can make major changes in the curve. And this ending looks a lot better. One of the main reasons we draw Kaplan-Meier curves is to get good estimates of the trial numbers. And one is the median where one half of the trial participants have had the event. We can see in the published text that the median is 9.9 .9 months. But with these censored patients, it's not as simple as identifying the middle patient in our list, or patient number 9. On the graph, we start at time 0 and 0 0.5 PFS, and we draw our line forward in time. The time when it intersects the curve is our median time and that represents patient number 12 at 9.85 months. As patients looking at this data, we should recognize that the median is just a single patient in this trial. The Kaplan-Meier curve estimates that half of the patients did worse, 
but half of the patients did better. Another significant point in the Kaplan-Meier estimation is the percentage of patients without the event at 6 or 12 months or some other time milestone. For the 6th month progression-free survival, we start at time 6 months and draw a line straight up until it intersects the curve. This curve estimates that 76% of the patients had no progression at 6 months. Sometimes Kaplan-Meier graphs will show, at regular intervals, the number of patients at risk or still participating in the trial. If they're present, they'll be shown at the bottom of the graph, like I have here in red. Now here's something useful that is rarely shown. These are the upper and lower 95% confidence interval limits. It's a measure of how confident we are in these measurements. Not very confident, are we? You get hints about that because of the low patient counts, but this really shows us that these results are not that firm. Maybe it's something researchers trying to publish a paper are not that excited to say. What do these 95% confidence interval limits mean? Well, if we were to rerun this trial 20 times, we'd expect that about 19 of the survival curves to be within the shaded area, and about one of them to be outside. 19 trials inside the limits, out of 20, gives us 95% limits. Trials with more participants give us more confidence in the results and the smaller gray zone. Let's take another look at the median progression-free survival of 9.85 months. How confident are we in that result? We draw the horizontal line at 0.5 PFS through the gray shaded area. This gives us confidence limits of 6.37 months to somewhere out past 16 months. The upper limit is undefined because there were too few patients out there. Let's also look at the 6-month progression-free survival limits. So we can see the original estimate of 76% has a confidence interval limits between 59% and 99%, a pretty wide range. Again, this large gray shaded area tells you that the results are not that firm. Larger trials will have smaller gray zones and more confidence in their results. What would the curve look like if we treated these censored patients differently? How good or bad could the results really be? The green line at top is what the curve would look like if we assumed that every censored patient had no tumor growth. It's essentially the most optimistic trial data. The brown line at bottom is what it would look like if we assumed that every censored patient did have tumor growth. It's the worst trial outlook. Both of these are unlikely trial outcomes and the Kaplan-Meier estimator comes out in between. The estimator uses the patient data for as long as it's valid and adjust the estimate at the next event. That's my review of how Kaplan-Meier graphs are made and some of their features. With this information, I hope you'll better understand how each patient contributes to the trial results and whether there's much confidence in the results. In the future, I'd like to show you how you can extract the raw data that the researchers didn't provide from these graphs. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below.